Podcasts. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. We end today's show in Evanston, Illinois, where the city council has agreed to pay black residents reparations for historic housing discrimination, making it the first U.S. city to adopt such a measure. In the first phase, the city will distribute some $400,000 to up to 16 families to be used toward housing-related costs. The city is committed to distribute $10 million over the next decade. For decades, black residents of Evanston were subjected to redlining, <coughs> which prevented them from obtaining bank loans to purchase property. This comes as civil rights groups are pushing for slavery reparations at a national level. Still with us, actor and activist Danny Glover, who serves on the National African American Reparations Commission. In 2019, he testified before the House in favor of reparations. He's also supported the reparations effort in Evanston. We're also joined by Evanston City Council member Robin Ruth Simmons, who led the reparations effort, and Dino Robinson, founder and executive director of Shorefront Legacy Center. He co-authored a report commissioned by Evanston officials on city policies and practices affecting black residents from 1900 to 1960 and through to the present day. Um, we're going to begin right now with Robin Ruth Simmons, city council member. Can you talk about what you have just passed and the significance of it? Absolutely. And thank you for having us this morning. Uh, what we passed actually was, in 2019, uh, a resolution to provide reparations to black Evanston residents. Uh, we passed it with funding from our cannabis sales tax with an initial commitment of $10 million. Um, and what we passed on this last Monday was the first disbursement or the first remedy, which is going to be in the form of a housing remedy. $25,000 direct benefits to eligible black residents um, for home equity, home wealth, uh, acquisition or purchase, any type of improvement, but something that will uh, build wealth through, through home equity. And I have to say that in 2002, under the leadership of Judge Lionel Jean Baptiste, who was, who was the second ward alderman at the time, our city passed a resolution in support of HR 40. Um, so we've been working towards this for some time in Evanston. Who gets the money? Can you explain what residents get it, what don't, who, do, sure. who doesn't, and what programs get it? Sure. So uh, our reparation eligibility is for black residents that lived in Evanston between 1919 and 1969 and their direct descendants. Um, you can learn more about that report at our uh, cityofevanston.org backslash reparations. It's over a 100-page report, and Dino can tell you more about that. But that time period is significant because not only redlining, but more specifically, the anti-Black housing policies that were enforced uh, by the city of Evanston specifically. This is an Evanston-specific reparation policy, so it was important that our case for reparation uh, was based on policies that were enforced by Evanston. This is Delois Robinson, whose family was subject to the racist practice of redlining in Evanston. My great-grandmother, who was in Evanston, I guess she probably been here since the late 30s, early 40s, and um, she was a business owner, and the redlining affect her and um, her husband because they were trying to open a business in, um, in a well-established area of Evanston. Um, when I say well-established, where it will be all types of um, nationalities that come through that area. But she was forced to just stay in one certain area to the point of she had to have the restaurant in her home. It kind of deals with your self-esteem. And so it's a thing of... Am I good enough to be able to stand on, on my own and say, no, I want property here, or um, I want to cross the redlining? 
So I want to turn to Dino Robinson now, founder and executive director of the Shorefront Legacy Center, the only community archive for black history on Chicago's suburban North Shore, lifelong Evanston resident who co-authored a 77-page report commissioned by Evanston officials on city policies and practices affecting black residents. Can you talk about what this means for your family and for your community, and specifically talk about the policies that were so discriminatory that are leading to reparations, Dino? Sure. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, when the city commissioned uh, myself and my colleagues to work on this report, we wanted to highlight our years of research, of our own research, that uh, showcased these uh, different discriminatory practices and put into one document. Um, once uh, the uh, 2019 uh, passing of the resolution happened, we started getting inundated with phone calls uh, and, and emails uh, looking for information. So this important document was uh, helpful in disseminating the information that was needed to help support reparations movement. What we saw in our report were like a series of patterns where at one time in Evanston's history, uh, there was no like black community as a one area. Everybody lived everywhere. But distinctly after 1900, you can see patterns where black families were forced to live in certain areas of Evanston. It started with zoning ordinances and then further supported with the Hope Maps uh, for redlining. Uh, further supported by um, land clearance ordinances in the 1940s as well that greatly impacted families, black families, and generational black families that lived in Evanston. And this report showcases that. And how this report helps and this repar um, reparations program helps is one step in helping to to uh, remedy uh, the, the past atrocities that happened against the black community throughout Evanston's history. Um, as far as my family is concerned, as alluded to earlier, uh, you know, who does this help? Um, it is a specific uh, segment of the black population that have long-time generational impact here in Evanston. Uh, I myself, I'm more or less a newcomer to Evanston. So um, in this parameter that's set up right now, uh, my family does not benefit from that. But I do believe that this program that is set forth is very helpful for the generational families that have been here. Interestingly, Jacob Blake, who was uh, shot by police officers seven times in the back in Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, isn't it true, Dino Robinson, his grandfather, uh, Jacob Blake, Reverend Jacob Blake, was seminal during the uh, civil rights battles of the 1960s, and there's a manor named for him there, Jacob Blake Manor. Yes, absolutely. He was very instrumental during the 60s, um, uh, fighting against uh, uh, predatory uh, real estate agencies, uh, work toward uh, steering black families into one area of Evanston um, and denying rental or home ownership in other parts of Evanston that are predominantly white. Um, in our archives at Shorefront, we have recordings from oral histories that I've recorded over the last 25 years. Families talking about experiences with racial discrimination and um, real estate agencies uh, who will not rent or, let, uh, or lease homes to black families outside of the designated area that we uh, that's known now as the Fifth Ward. Danny Glover, can you talk about how you got involved with this? You were back in Evanston in 2019. You were speaking up for this reparations bill. You've spoken next to ta Coates in Congress for reparations. How significant is this? Well, well I mean, I can't—we can't tell you how. I mean, there's no way to express how significant this is. It's, it's part of this—the multi— of, of um, expressions by local communities. I mean, and if we talk about this on a local level, imagine how that resonates beyond Evanston, Illinois. Imagine the kind of discourse that happens, the discussions in community by ordinary citizens about reparation. Yes, amazingly, in Cobra, has played an extraordinary part as well. But you have Sir Hillary Beckles for CARICOM is studying the whole idea of, res of reparations as a regard to them, as those, those CARICOM countries and the colonizer that, that, that extracted 
wealth from them. So you have that on the one hand. But we don't have anything on the national level. We, we, have, we can get these small examples, but this has to be supported by the actions. This action, simply a study, H.R. 40, introduced by John Conyers, a democratic socialist, introduced by him when he came to Congress every year, has to be, act, be, be the most responsible thing that we can do on the federal level. Because these, what it, will, what it will do, what will happen is you'll have a multiplication of expressions. And then within that, we figure out what works, what doesn't work, what are the things that we, we need to shape and reshape about it, all these are where, but it becomes a public discussion. And that's what is happening in Evanston, Illinois, right now. Speaking of the <clears throat> racial wealth gap, um, I want to give you one example. The median net worth of black families in Boston is just $8. The median net worth of white families in Boston, $250,000, nearly 31,000 times as much. Boston's new mayor, Kim Janey, uh, is the city's first black mayor, the first woman mayor, has vowed to address this. But weave this in to what we're seeing in Evanston now. Danny. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. You, you, you were saying what now? I'm uh, sorry. Just the wealth gap, so massively uh, well, different. Well, 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 of course. You know, I, I was just thinking about one of the— what, what did uh, Martin Luther King say? Uh, one of the best anti-poverty anti program was the union. Um, it's certainly um, an, an expression of this wealth gap, which, which, is, which is, is real. Uh, how do we put our, our minds around that? What are the things that we do around that? Certainly, repar reparatory justice or, or reparation is a way of, of, of not correcting the ills that have been done in the past, historically been done in the past. So that, that, that is another question that we have to, to, to grapple with, you know, when we talk about, because so much attention has given to, to, the, to this wealth gap. And, but at the same time, we know that, <clears throat> that, that there's poverty, you know, there's poverty among not only brown, black, and poor whites as well. Mm -hmm. So how we address the issue and talk about the wealth gap as we see what is happening to this, this system, this economic system, as a result of COVID, the impact that it has on those who had, who had traditionally and historically been, uh, uh, been a, a, a cut out of the system, what does it mean now for the whole country itself? Um, finally, Robin Rue Simmons, um, it, it, it hasn't been determined um, the total use of the $10 million. You're going to be holding a series of public hearings. Um, can you talk about what you think will happen? And also, have many cities around the country gotten in touch with you now? Uh, thank you. So, so we started with a uh, public process to get to this initial uh, commitment of a housing remedy, and we will continue. As you stated, we've only identified the first uh, four percent of our ten million fund, ten million dollar fund, and I want to add that that fund is growing by the buy-in from our stakeholder in our ally community, as well as businesses and uh, face houses of worship that have been contributing to the fund as well. Um, so we will continue with a public process, stakeholder participation in uh, giving the reparation committee direction on what they believe remedy is for the black community in Evanston. Of course, we'll have to do that in line with our purview as a municipal government and in line with our local case for reparations, which has been um, developed by Shorefront Legacy Center and uh, Dino's team. But one thing that will continue to remain a process is our national partners, namely in COBRA. And COBRA has supported our community Five by, participating, by, by participating and leading and educating our residents, and we're really grateful. But we will continue with the public process to, to determine the next 
$9,600,000. Well, I want to thank you so much for being with us. Evanston City Council Member Robin Rue Simmons, Dino Robinson of the Shorefront Legacy Center, and Danny Glover, actor and activist, have a safe trip from Vancouver to Bessemer, Alabama today. That does it for our show. A very happy birthday to Nermeen Sheikh. I'm Amy Goodman. Wearing a mask is an act of love. Where to?